Tumbaga. I am actually part of the team here in Beta Seattle. Um, if you guys don't know what Beta Seattle if Beta is, we're a software retail store in a nutshell. Um, basically, we are a software powered retailer that provides an out of box experience. Um, thank you all for coming. Especially thank you to our panelists and our moderator. Our moderator today, tonight is Michelle Lee from King Five. And our, our, our panelists are Kaylee from Peddler Brewing, Mike, Mike from Rad Power Bikes, who actually has been a partner with Beta for quite some time, and we love having him. <laughs> Dan from Glow Forge. David and Tab from Free Fly Systems, which actually they just signed a contract with us to be a Can we separate the names yeah. so I know who's clapping for who? Who's gonna be clapping? Yeah. <laughs> 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 what? Without further ado, Michelle? No, we're not good. Okay, so we have curated a very long list of questions, but I think because we want to be able to have you guys ask questions, we will do half. So, um, and if there's any point in time, since we're all a community, you want to shout out and ask a question or a follow up, just do it. We're all friends, so it's perfect. Um, I'll start out with a really easy one. Maybe if just, no, well, if you guys all really want to answer these questions, you can, but just, I think maybe like two or three at a time is probably okay. Uh, when or how did you know that your passion could actually be more than a hobby? And was it something that you actually had to work toward, or was there like a light bulb moment? How did it work for you? Don't all go at once. All right. <laughs> I'll jump in. So, <clears throat> Glowforge is my fourth company. Uh, I started a company that was doing um, cloud service for camera phones, and then uh, a company that was doing comparison shopping. And both of those were very much like, I want to start a startup, and I want to start a company. I'm excited about this technology. Uh, and then I did something just crazy for fun. I was sitting with my kids and um, they wanted to play Shoots and Ladders because I have four -year -old, at the time four-year-old twins and I was horrified by that. So we invented a game together and I got really excited about this and it was something I wanted to share with the world. So I put it up on Kickstarter and it turned into this sort of Kickstarter phenomenon, a board game called Robot Turtles. And it was the first time I did something just because I loved it so much and wanted to do it. I had no intention of turning it into a business, but it kind of pulled me there. Uh, and then in prototyping for that, discovered this strange technology. It was kind of backwater, but uh, like created in the 80s and never really advanced laser cutting engraving technology and fell in love a second time. And so I wound up licensing out the board game business to a partner and set out on a mission to go make this technology available to people so other people could create the same way I'd gotten to create. And this finally, after you know, three other companies, this finally really felt like my life's calling. And so that was when I said, okay, this, this is the thing I really want to, to build and to grow. And that's, that's what I've been doing for the past three years and change, and no, no signs of letting up. Awesome. Anyone else? I've got kind of a funny story. Uh, so I had a job that I really didn't like doing sales, and I was doing photography on the side and kind of marketing these aerial photos I was taking from drones. and. When I really knew it could be something, uh, I had an inbound request for a job, but I had a really busy week at work, so I knew that there was no way I was going to be able to do that job. So when I sent out the bid, I just bid this insane high number. I bid like $100,000 for this job to take photos in Aspen of some new construction. And they called and said, yeah, that's good. Can you be down here next week to do that? And I was like, wow, this is an inflection point. Now it's, now it's go time. So I had to, I had to like quickly call a friend, figure out if they could help quit the first job. And it, it's been on ever since then for me. Thanks for the tip. Yeah. <laughs> Bit high. Bit high. <laughs> Anyone else want to jump in? And that was actually the last time it's been easy to make money in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, what were your challenges the first year of your business? And how'd you overcome them? I guess I can jump in for that. Um, so my husband and I started Peddler Brewing Company, and if you have not had our beer, please drink it so I don't have to carry a full keg back with me. Um, and we were completely DIY, self-funded, bootstrap operations. Um, and so for our first year, it was um, 
a lot of work of just um, keeping going. We had our day jobs at the time and we would come home at the end of the day and go straight into this warehouse once we started renting it and remodeling it ourselves um, and figuring out how to start a business and what forms you need to fill out and what bills to pay and all of those things. Um, and so it was for us just a matter of momentum. Um, I don't know if I could ever do that again, um, but it was really fun. And then as far as the self-funding part of it, it was you know taking our savings and putting it into the business. And then each month um, when we you know, had paid our bills, whatever we had left over from our, our day jobs, we threw into the business account and just keeping that going as long as we could. Um, so it was definitely uh, not the approach that most people take, but um, we fully own our business. We always have, we don't have loans. Everything has been really successful because of us putting all of our time and energy into it. Wow. What about, how does that differ from like, you know, how long have you been in business? How does that differ from like the first year to like the second year to the third year? I mean, is there a point where yeah. you're like, okay, there was a point where I had a day off. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we opened our doors um, five years ago, five and a half years ago, and my husband and I exclusively ran the business in the tasting room um, with our day jobs for about six months, um, then quit our day jobs so that we could be open more days of the week and brew more beer. Um, and then hired on my brother-in-law, uh, my husband's brother, um, about a year after being open, and it was just the three of us for another year. Um, and then we expanded our space and we had to hire employees. So it was probably about a year of just us and then another year with one other person. And now we have managers and employees and I have weekends off, so that's <laughs> Did you all have day jobs before, while you were doing you know, your big project? I mean, other day jobs besides the one that you're doing. You know, did you have to yeah, balance yeah, that? Yeah, the very beginning, yeah. yeah. I mean, for us, when you, for, for me, when you go back, it wasn't like there was a clear delineation of like, now you own a successful business. It was like, <laughs> you got this crazy idea and you know, maybe some money starts flowing in, but you're kind of tiptoeing out on the ice. You're like, is this a real thing or am I about to get just dunked? Um, and so it happens incrementally over time. I think the tough thing for us in the first year was really coming to grips with the fact that this was gonna be something that was gonna continue uh, and grow and start behaving in that manner. And then also there's a constant problem that every business has, unless you're just a crazy venture funded uh, madness company is cash flow. Mm -hmm. You get, you know, you sell some things and you have a moment where you're like, wow, I'm pretty rich. And then you have to realize <laughs> that you have to buy twice as many for the next order. You're like, wow, I'm pretty poor. <laughs> I think the other difference like in the first year versus the years after is like in the first year, you kind of have everything in your head and you have so few people that you kind of all just know what's happening. You don't even have to really write anything down. And But then when you start bringing in more people, you realize you have to have some systems in place or things go really badly. So, yeah. <laughs> I bet. And how many people work for you guys? Uh, right now? Are we 40, 45, something like that? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, 45. Yeah. But managing Cindy is like three people, so I just found out for 50. I just found out for 50. <laughs> We should invite her up here. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the challenges I think all these businesses and the panel have in common is that we're hardware startups, and a lot of us are all, I think we're all bootstrapped where we started with kind of the crowdfunding as a backing us. So that means we have products that everyone wants, whether it's beer or 3D, 3D laser cutters or electric bikes. It's, it's, uh, for, for us, it's always been uh, keeping up with demand and, and doing that without taking on a dollar of funding. So, I think that's, you can't say enough about the value of doing that. It forces you to build a sustainable business. It forces you to find people that are um, purely passion driven to join your team because they're not going to be making you know, six figures out of the gate. They're going to be taking a bit of a haircut. Uh, but the passion and, and the day to day, it just makes it all worth it. So in the end, I think I think maybe I speak for all of us here, like being bootstrapped, it's really hard, but it, I think it really is worth it um, in the long run. It's I'm the odd really man out. Fun. Yeah. It's really fun. <laughs> uh, I'm the odd man out because we raised uh, about $40 million of venture capital and uh, took about $60 million in pre-orders before we shipped our first product. So when you get a Glowforge, there's $100 million worth of goodness in that box. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that said, my immediate prior project of Robot Turtles, the board game, was just entirely self-funded, done at home. 
took some time off of, like, had a real job because Google bought my previous company, so I worked there for a while. Took a leave of absence, stayed at home with the kids, and cooked this thing up, and then did everything myself from start to finish. You know, found the factory in North Carolina that did the, the board game printing, did a Kickstarter, did the shipping, the whole nine yards. I hired the babysitter to help me. <laughs> uh, that was about it. <laughs> so both sides, and uh, yeah, it's really rewarding to do it yourself. Yeah. Just a tip, you can always identify the venture back guy because he's dressed a little bit nicer. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you know, <laughs> knowing what you know now about like how to get funding, would you do it the same way? I mean, I've done it every which way. So I've done angel backed, I've done self funded, I've done venture backed, and they're all just a question of what's right for the business. Mm -hmm. So like taking venture money for a brewery would be a Terrible mistake that would make everybody sad and mad at each other, <laughs> and and doing what we were doing any other way just wouldn't have been possible because there was so much research and development that had to go into making it. The mm -hmm. molds for the plastic case for a Glowforge cost almost half a million dollars just for one piece, one mold for one case, and so that's not the sort of thing you can you can bootstrap, uh, and that's that's a, a difficult uh, match to figure out what's the right way to find your business. To say it sounds like there would be a lot of growing pains. Like you don't just go to like a class and figure out how to get funding and how to start your business and how to you know manufacture all those things, right? So what what kind of advice would you give to someone who's got this idea but they don't know really where to start? I think the most important thing is like right product, right place, right time because then the funding it happens, the partners it ha they happen organically. Um, if you don't have that right match, maybe it's not the right time, maybe it's not the right product, then you need to adjust until you kind of have that match. Because I'm in the same, same way, I've been, this is my third or fourth startup, and, and, and the past ones you've learned a lot along the way and, and kind of adjust, uh, adjust and, then, and then things just take off like wildfire when there's that right match. How has it changed for you guys to be kind of, you know, these inventors and these creative types to become CEOs? It hasn't. Is that bad? <laughs> okay, no, that's good. That's good. Yeah. No difference. No difference. No, it's different. I mean, you only get to invent like half the day. Uh, you got to like, you know, you got to put in your time on the spreadsheets and teams and managing and that kind of thing. And then if you do a great job of that, and you carve off a little chunk to go try and figure out what you're going to do in the future, that's what keeps me going. Man, it is like one of the happiest times in my month when our CTO comes by and is like, I'm stuck on a problem. Like, could you help with this? I'm like, oh, I need to work on like doing something. And yeah, that your, your job changes rapidly as the company grows and figuring out what it should change into is one of the hardest jobs. Figuring out what it is that you can do to add value. Um, and mo more often than not, the answer is support your team. So that becomes the, the core, uh, but you never stop doing little things. And there's always something that's, it's a little thing and you're like, gosh, I could go ask somebody to do it, but by the time I've done that, I could have just done it myself. So you get your hands dirty from time to time. You have to be willing to, we were talking about this, take out the garbage, scrub the windows, like whatever needs to be done. Um, but you're just getting into that business of trying to make other people more effective instead of doing it yourself. Then how do you continue to kind of um, feed that creative beast inside of you? How do you continue to be creative? Personally, I design stuff to print on my Glowforge at home. <laughs> we keep drinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. Oh, so good. I do that in, in writing stories too. Dave, Dave uses a similar technique as well. Yeah. Drinking or using the product? <laughs> drinking. Uh, and then using the product, but yeah. yeah. But, so that's been really important for me. It's like it's easy because I just commute every day on an e-bike. But being close to your product, I think you hear that from a lot of. A lot of CEOs is that you get further and further away from your product, and that's when quality things will come up, and that's when the product will start kind of depreciating it. And um, so, just maintain that like laser focus on the product and living and breathing the product or drinking it. <laughs> yeah. well, kind of adding to that, how do you keep a community um, and grow a community around your product to keep you know people engaged and excited about what you're doing? I think from well. For our brewery, one of the things that I really cared about um, when starting it was not the beer. That was not my passion. That was my husband's passion. But starting a, a retail, customer service driven business that really provided a space that was a community space um, was really important to me. And we, being self-funded, didn't write a business plan, didn't really do financial projections, just kind of did it. <laughs> and so I didn't really think about, you know, what would my job be in the future? What would I be doing? What would our space be like? Um, and 
right now, most of my job is event planning. Um, we do tons of events on, in our space. We do fundraisers, we bring the community together. Um, and that has been the most meaningful and fun part of it for me. Um, it's also helped us find really great employees who really not only like beer, but love who we are in our community and want to be a part of that and really support us and, and can show that um, in how they present themselves as the face of our business um, and the care that they give to it and the feedback that we're given from them about concerns that they have about ways that they can improve um, has really been big for us. Um, and about like the you know where you kind of are up in the business um, you know we have weekly meetings with our with our chapter managers and um, there are five of us that get together we just talk about things so how are things going how can we do things better and really like I mean I'm not my employee so I don't know for sure how they feel but I feel like that <laughs> there's kind of that like I can say anything and you know I can just tell them that something's horrible or it's good or whatever and it's gonna be taken really well and together we're gonna problem solve and make it better um, and that it's not um, a scary conversation and it's really about increasing the the friendliness of our space and, and really how it is for the customer Love yeah. it. so for our team it's always been about building a lot of value into the product when there's a lot of value, it's something you want to share with your friends, right? So whether it's a coupon that's, oh, this is fantastic. Lululemon's having a huge sale, right? And everyone runs down there. But those we just try to build a lot of value in the product. And that, that sharing creates the community because everyone wants to be a part of something. So for us, it's everyone wants to be part of the e bike gang now, which is kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit about Seattle and advocacy. Um, the first question that I have is, you know, how did Seattle become your headquarters? Was it ch by chance? Uh, how has that changed now that you know we keep growing and growing? And these are like many questions. <laughs> and then also, you know, why do you choose to stay here? So you can answer any of those questions. <laughs> I guess I can start. Um, I'm from here, and clearly we were continuing our day jobs when we were starting the business, so it had to stay local. Um, and my husband literally got on his bike and biked around until he found a spot, a couple areas that looked good and called the numbers on the buildings and we ended up in our space um, in Ballard, which is not where we lived in Capitol Hill at the time, but um, we moved to Ballard and, and it has become our home because that's where our business is and we want it to be walkable to our business so we can walk to work. It's nice. Yeah, it's, it's great. really nice. Yeah. Or you could e-bike to work too. I could, but <laughs> <laughs> by the time I turn it on, I'd be there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think Seattle's really well suited for businesses that have a high like growing headcount because uh, real estate's less expensive here, but the office space compared to San Francisco or another major tech hub and then just West Coast, so it's just the most logical place for us. Um, plus a major growing uh, bike community here. Obviously sure. you can sell bike lanes going in this year now. Sure. So it's all it's all good. <laughs> Any other thoughts? I don't have a particularly interesting answer to this one, so I think I'll skip it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was in North Carolina, and then he lived out here, so I was like, stay in North Carolina, go to Seattle. And, Seattle. and where were you in North Carolina? Uh, right, right on the coast, near Atlanta Beach. Okay, I lived in right, uh, Wilmington oh, for a okay. while, so, yeah. But, close. you know, a lot of manufacturing jobs are in Wilmington, and, or I mean, in, in North Carolina. I was looking for Lunch. an adventure, too, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, what about, like, corporate social responsibility? A lot of people about that it's just as important as your product or what you're offering so how have you built advocacy into your company from the very beginning and also how has it changed or grown we started out with <coughs> um, what I refer to as uh, sitting in the white guy hole which was where three white guy co-founders <laughs> building a product that was really designed to unlock creativity for everybody and we knew that we would fail if we, you know, uh, all over 40, if we all just built a product for people like us. And so we sat down early and often and said, how do we build a diverse company from the outset so that we have a company that reflects the customers that we aspire to have? Uh, and, you know, my, my short test is something matters to a business if the business spends money on it. So my first question is, how do I spend money building a diverse company? Uh, and we wound up spending a lot of money on lawyers. <laughs> and, uh, and part of that was we created a program where uh, we actually pay for diverse referrals who get hired. So if somebody refers somebody to the company, actually what I should say is if somebody starts working at the company, uh, we say, hey, was there somebody who referred to you and do you consider yourself underrepresented in tech? And if the answer to both of those is yes, then we pay that person $5,000. And it took three months, and I don't know how many lawyer bills to make that pass muster as a program that we could do legally. 
uh, we do things like we publish our um, healthcare plan on the company website so that if you're a trans person, if you're going through, uh, if you've got pregnancy, if you're planning for that, or any number of other med medical conditions, you can see if our insurance works for you without having to ask an embarrassing question of your recruiter. And we do things uh, like uh, recruit from all sorts of diverse sources. Once we, people show up for an interview, it's the best person gets the job. So we have to work really hard to bring in diverse folks uh, at the recruiting stage so that we have our, our pick of great people. What turned out was that after we hired a few great people from diverse backgrounds, then word got out and we started getting amazing candidates we never would have had access to who were leaving top tier tech companies and saying, hey, I hear you're not a terrible place to work. <laughs> it turns out that not being a terrible place to work is a strategic asset when you're trying to recruit amazing people. So that's really been something that we've spent a lot of time and energy on as a, as a cause that matters to us in the company. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Anyone else have any thoughts on that one? That's a great answer. Can't follow up on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, there was one that I had that I Oh, I should, oh. I should just finish with the brag that we're now more than half women and over 25% people of color and underrepresented minorities, so it finally nice. worked after three years. Mm -hmm. Nice, that's awesome. Well, as I was going to say, to follow up on that um, with everyone, so as you do scale up, you know, how do you make sure that you continue to have a positive company life for the people who work for you? Because that can be difficult, you know, too. Yeah, we're, we're undergoing that challenge right now. We're kind of growing out of our startup phase. We're over almost 70 employees now. So it's now we're trying to make the decision to we go into like a conventional office space where you know, the human space is more efficient, or we keep that more startup and culture. And we're, we're definitely going toward the more industrial chic feel. So we're proud to try to maintain the ping pong table is critical. The, the beer on Fridays is critical. It's just that kind of stuff, that social environment. Plus, all of our employees get a, an electric bike as soon as they start working there, which is important to kind of bring the whole team together and also make it easier to get to work and without, with a smile on your face. Yeah, that's great. I think for us, we build in kind of health and performance into the culture uh, quite a bit. So it's kind of something that just started with a small group of people and has really taken over. And uh, I think it's also supported by like one of our key philosophies, which is don't make unnecessary rules. Um, so if you don't make unnecessary rules and you hire great people, you give them the freedom to do what they want to do, then they, they tend to self-organize uh, and create awesome systems to take care of each other and have meaningful relationships and do a good job. Oh yeah, they want to work harder for you. Um, just some easy questions, you know, what did you learn the hard way about starting a business that you <coughs> wish someone had told you before you started? Keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, that's really, we, 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 you know, some people want to introduce very complex financial wranglings and it's, at the end of the day, just like you need more money to flow into the business than flows out. That's, about that's it. it. Like, that's, that's all you need. And don't let anybody tell you that it's more complex than that. It's because two numbers. If, yeah. <laughs> if they're telling you that it's more complex than that, you should run away very quickly. Um, okay. What about, um, what do you think is like the most important trait for someone, like an entrepreneur, to have? Is it grit? Is it passion? Is it. Um, Intelligence, I don't know. What do you think helps? Resiliency. Yeah. yeah. You just have to get your ass kicked all day long and show up at seven the <laughs> next like morning it. and be like, let's go again. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Hit the reset button. Yeah. I like that being able to hit the reset button. Um oh I know. Here's one for you guys. So what's what's your can't live without gadget? <laughs> That's not your own. <laughs> Tab. Uh, I have this thing <laughs> called Aura Ring, which tracks all kinds of sleep and performance metrics, like heart rate variability, and it's helped me a ton to get in better shape. Can you get it here? I don't think yeah. you can get it here, but they have a similar the product called the Motive Ring. Oh. Right, right there next to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's very similar to that. Um, it provides really nice analytics about you know, your, your heart rate variability, which is a good proxy for your readiness to perform, how well you slept the night before, and we've got a bunch of other people in the company have jumped on board and it's helped them too. Like this guy? This guy's also from Free Fly. <laughs> Styling over there. <laughs> Anybody else? Gadgets? This guy's got a lot of gadgets. What's your favorite gadget? Oh, my gadgets? Yeah. 
I mean, I've been paring down lately. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I'd say smartphone, but that's boring. So, okay. yeah. but that's still, I mean, a, ne a, a necessity that we all have. It is. Know, I mean, so. these days I try to like either turn it off or turn off notifications, but it's still very important. So, yeah. Yeah. I, well, I don't, I don't know. I would say on the opposite of that, uh, we didn't have internet at home. Wow. when we started, um, and that was a really good decision on my part, I would say, because it forced me to separate myself from my business when I went home. I mean, I had a smartphone, but we also have a no phones in the bedroom rule and all kinds of stuff like that. So um, it was a really great decision, and it also saves money <laughs> when you're scrapped for money. But uh, we, we moved into a place the night got mad at Comcast and just never got around to setting it up because I didn't want to call it back. Um, so anyway, um, but I, yeah, I guess I, my, my bike would be, you know, that's what I would do. Um, I also have a Garmin watch. Um, I, I've done an Ironman and triathlons, and so it's been, that's my escape is working out, or was. I got pregnant now. I don't know what I do. Yeah. But. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. sleep and I you sleep eat. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> what about? Oh, go ahead. I was going to ask if I could go back to the whatever somebody told me. Oh yeah. Because yeah, I was Please. reminded when you talked about phone, which was. Uh, a, Spark by two companies ago, I realized I was tearing myself apart because I had young twins at home at the time. They were two or three, and uh, uh, and every single night I would go okay, here's this work thing. Maybe it's a networking event, or maybe it's uh, uh, I need to stay late and do this, or whatever else. And there's my family waiting for me at home. Which is more important, my family or my job? And you cannot ask yourself that question every day without driving yourself crazy. And, and it took me months before I finally realized just the simplest solution, which was I sat down with my wife and said, here's what I'm thinking, which is I'm gonna be home for dinner at least four nights a week. And she's like, that's fantastic. And I was like, yes. And then I have three nights when I'm gonna work and I can trade work off against work and I can like be home four nights a week and then I can feel good about that. And so I'm not tearing myself apart. So that, that notion that you said about making space mm -hmm. for what's the business and where does the stress go and then breaking away from that and, and drawing some room to be apart from that, I think is, is crucial to keeping yourself focused and sane and being your best. And see, I think that's so refreshing to hear from you guys because I feel like you don't have to be an entrepreneur or a CEO or a you know, super creative mind to, to be someone who is working 24-7 and not knowing when to turn it off you know, or feeling pressure. Like, you know you want to turn it off, but then I'm still like in my bed like this and I'm like, I shouldn't be doing this. You know, so it's refreshing to hear like setting rules with your family or for yourself um, and, and trying to those out I, think. I, I actually like can't execute it myself so I check my phone in with my fiance when I get home <laughs> wow <laughs> nice <laughs> Good point. Yeah. that's great when do you get it back in the morning yeah okay <laughs> I was gonna ask too um, what you know what other creative outlets uh, do you have or what do you do outside of work that kind of keeps you a, a balanced human being or do you have any deal? No, what, so what happened was uh, I used to have a uh, wood shop in my garage and I like learned woodworking and built tables and all that and then the kids were born. And it takes like 30 minutes to set up and 30 minutes to clean up and that's more time than you have in any contiguous space in your parent. So I started goofing around and building drones and RC airplanes and other stuff because at least you go and like dabble for 15 minutes but I always want to make things with my hands. And then when I got a hold of this like giant industrial carbon dioxide cutting laser that I imported from a factory in China and installed in my garage. There's this terror in my, in my garage and figured out how to use it, I had this moment of delight. And so the reason I was making that face was because it's a total cliche, but what I do for my creative outlet is use this product. And it's so amazing because I can sit down and I can play around for 15 minutes, I can hit print, I can hold something, and then like, hey, I made this. And, and for the first time in my life, I've actually had like my family and friends be like, hey, could you take that thing you do for a living? And like, you know, can I do that too? Or could you make something for me? So it's, I, I think having that creative outlet is crucial. And I, I'm just in the weird place where my passion and my hobby intersect, which is, which is pretty awesome. That's here. great. Yeah. If you're in that place, yeah. I think I think all four of us have yeah. found that. Yes, yeah, so we hold pretty sacred our like late night after hour e-bike builds and our, our 
RV area. So like all the tech guys will get together and maybe sometimes drink a few too many beers, but usually just drive them out and uh, and build basically crazy e-bikes, so drift trikes or high-powered e-bikes, but off-road only. Of <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see those. That'd be kind of cool. Were you? I'm just curious too. Were you guys? Were you all creative children? Or, I mean, did you have people in your life who influenced you to... Is this a nice way of saying that I misbehave? <laughs> <laughs> well, I always think that's inspiring, you know, yeah. where you like the, you know, the person to check off, like, all their, you know, things for their for their grades, or are you creative kids? Do you have someone who said, like, you know, be as creative as you can? Did you have, you know, good influences? Yeah, I mean, the first e-bike that I built when I was 15 years old was, like, made out of random scraps, ripped out of appliances, and... So I just run around the house with the all the wire was held together with a salsa container. <laughs> so I've had that through and through, and that's why it's hard for me to stare at screens all day. So I do have to like break away for a few hours each day to like really get back with the product, with the product team, and like focus on what I feel in here. Sure, yeah. I think like being curious is one of the main things that I know both Tab and I have always been curious about how things work, and then. Once you kind of learn how they work, and you're like, well, what, what can happen next? Like, what's the next thing? And then you just, I don't know, you start thinking about new ideas. So. Yeah, I'm curious. I love that. Um, I don't. What time is it? Because I know we close at nine, so I just want to make sure that everyone has a chance to. Seven forty. Okay. We. Will, I don't want you guys to be able to network as well. So, does anyone have any questions, or do you want to throw out any, I don't know, any stories? I think brand is the most important thing you can do in your business. So, did you the brand you started with? Is that still the brand that you believe in today? Who's have stories that say, "Yep, I'm there," and others that say, "No, I changed." For us, we we have definitely kept the brand, um, and we don't really outsource anything, but we outsource branding. And I think that that was one of the smartest decisions we did was to hire, I mean, it was a friend, but a graphic designer who really spent the time to, to dive into what that looks like and then was able to take what we had as this vision and this passion and really put it into something that represented that and then has continued to help us along the way. Um, take that and as we create you know new beers and, and all of that kind of continuing with the themes that are meaningful and important to us um, and the, the bicycling part of our business so we're like um, a bike focus brewery I guess um, we that the, there's always been a bike on our product and it's been a part of it and it's been very visible within our space um, and and you know the nonprofits that we support and now I'm on board of directors of bicycle community groups and stuff. Um, so it's really continued to be a, even a bigger part of my life, I think, than it was at the beginning. I kind of lived into it. Yeah. I think our, our, our brand has stayed aligned. I would just say, um, in the beginning, uh, if you asked us what our brand is, we're probably a little bit aspirational in describing it back then. But I think we have achieved a point where we're actually living up to what those early aspirations were. We were kind of BSing a little bit. <laughs> That's okay. Painting the vision. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're having some room to grow. Mm -hmm. Who else has a question? Thanks. So, um, Randy might give you the answer to uh, this question uh, partly, but um, just wondering along the way if you realize, okay, I need some help. I need an expert in something that I'm lacking that um, for my business to work, where you found your weak point. Did you wind up finding something like that, getting some consulting, uh, whether it's a client or professional, what that looks like? Yeah, so, so for us, we we've done this like six times where we get like what, the valley of death, but of our employee base, where we just don't have enough people, and then we hire ten or fifteen more people. So it, you feel that early on, and you, but you never, it never goes away. You just keep having a rhythm, <laughs> and but each time the, the the valley gets a little less deep. Yeah. I, I actually I think about that and I almost caution the opposite, which is so many times I've seen like, I don't know, um, I don't know how this should work, I don't know how Facebook ads work, I don't know how, um, uh, uh, how to pitch to a, PR, uh, to a, uh, a journalist, I'm going to go hire an expert. And then you find out, you know, like $5,000, $10,000 later and lots of time and energy that you know, okay, they did the thing that they do, but you didn't get the level of genuineness, you didn't get the level of connection, you didn't get the same experience that you would have if somebody in your company, you or uh, or somebody you're working with, 
had gone and done that themselves. So sometimes, absolutely bring in consultants, bring in experts and the like, but I've seen the mistake made the opposite more often, which is, oh, I'm just gonna trust this person with my blank, and then that person doesn't have the skin in the game, doesn't have the passion, doesn't have the depth, and so you do better as a passionate amateur who loves your product and your company than as a skilled consultant who's gonna leave at the end of the day. Just going on with what Dan said, you know, even with news and stuff, we get so many poorly written and executed pitches from people who I know like get paid well. And I don't want to knock any PR <laughs> folks because some of them are awesome. But I'm always surprised that someone's getting paid to give these pitches to us. Uh, they feel very impersonal. They feel they're like 20 pages long. You know, we need who, what, when, where, why. And in some cases, you know, you can do that. Some I get um, better pitches and tweets, you know, sometimes than actual emails. And I, that's a very good point because you know we like innovation, we like to hear new things, and we get in the grind of like, you know, the attorney general put this out, you know, and we we get into like crime or whatever. So we don't always have the the space, the bandwidth, you know, to do these innovative stories. But if you sell it to me and you tell me like why it's important, we always like always make time for it. So um, so that's a really good point because people do spend a lot of time and energy in people who are not invested in, in you or your product. I would also mm -hmm. add to that that just asking people who have done it before. Yeah. Um, I, we were obviously, you know, there's other breweries in Seattle, they're not gonna want another one. I mean, we weren't like, the, there's a lot now, and they're, they're great. But, and they come to <laughs> us, you know? And, and I might think like, well, we don't need another brewery, but I'm gonna tell you everything I got. And part of it is, you know, it's a sense of pride for them. They work through it, they're excited about it, they know that you're trying yourself and very willing to share. Like, the amount of knowledge that people are willing to give you for free is incredible. Um, they're also drunk. <laughs> and just just calling. I mean, I have called every governmental agency, typically not telling them who I am, because I don't know if I'm doing things right or not. And so, you know, then I ask, like, hey, you know, if someone were to do this, <laughs> what do you think? Or, hey, I, there's this, you know, how do you pay this tax? Um, and they just tell you. You know, people are people are so willing to. Um, and so that's yeah, that's something that I would say that we didn't do as much at the beginning that I think we should have was asking. And if you do need to hire somebody, don't hire the person who says they're going to help you. Hire the person who helped you. The person who sat down, spent an hour, and you're like, oh, I understand now. And also, could you do that? Yeah. <laughs> so can you tell us a story of customers using your product that really gave you joy or inspired you? Something I mean, we get a lot of people with disabilities. Um, electric bike with the, with the Mopad and motor power sets uh, been a real joy for us just seeing people become mobile again and, and being able to explore in ways you can with uh, maybe a wheelchair or, or another assistive device. That's awesome. I never even thought about that. Uh, <clears throat> our internal company motto is we have the best customers because we have the best customers and there are so many things I see that just make my heart sore from a pediatric cardiologist who designed a training rig so that people could practice a surgery on, <clears throat> on a tester instead of an actual child, which was the state of the art before. Like, I'll do this stitch, you do that stitch, and now for $50, there's this thing where they can go and practice. To uh, people who quit their job, uh, there's a, a woman who worked retail in uh, Redmond and quit her job to go work from home full time with her daughter as a cosplay props designer because she got her glow forge and now she could do that. To a woman who uh, was had gone back to work because she had a business on Etsy selling handcrafted leather masks, but because she had arthritis, she couldn't do the precision cutting anymore. And then she got her Glowforge and she started using her Glowforge to do that work so she could go and go back to working for herself. Like, building tools that become a part of people's lives is just amazing. And getting to hear those stories is the best part of my day. Who's telling your stories for you? I go to hashtag Glowforge on Instagram okay. anytime I'm feeling sad. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like 20 minutes ago, somebody made that. Yeah. It's incredible. I'm going to do that. I'm going to find those people. <laughs> When somebody recommends my business to me, 
that's a good day. Oh. <laughs> that's awesome. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think. Uh, uh, sales doing it uh, around cycle. I went to your store with some colors. Totally crowded. Yeah, sales are good. We had a uh, <laughs> so we've been we've been going in and out of stock this spring. We we ordered to a certain level. And we've had to spool up production in, in ways that have never been done before in the e-bike industry. That's for sure. Um, so today we had stock come back in. So we had a line of about sixty people out the door in the little Ballard bicycle shop, which is un really un unusual but um, fun to see and also painful when there's sixty one people and the first, last person in line doesn't get a bike and they have to wait another week. So. So it's good and bad problem to have, right? Do you teams all seem really passionate about uh, the things they do? Um, outside of having a cool product, what do you do to foster a culture in the company? For me, it's tell the truth. <clears throat> Just, uh, I kind of think of like truth as its own economy, and you can either tell the whole truth at every moment in the business, or you're going to accrue a big truth debt in the future, and you're going to have to reconcile that. So <laughs> it always it's comes back. Just uh, tell the truth. Yeah. But also happy hour. <laughs> and happy, and happy when you run out of money. That's when you need to search. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> no, but seriously, I think for us, uh, you have to fall in, you have to build a prototype that you fall in love with, and you have to be connected enough to your industry to know that that love is genuine and that other people will feel the same way about it. Um, and th that love for the product has to be strong enough that you're gonna cut you know, a check for $500,000 in tooling or you know, whatever the specifics might be with launching that specific hardware product. But there's definitely a day in the product development cycle where you have to say like, I'm committed to this, we're buying the parts for it, we're cutting the tools for this. And it, it really, you know, on most of the preceding days to those, you know, it ends up with like Dave and I taking the long walk and kind of red teaming the whole thing and saying, what are the ways in which this could go wrong? And of those possible universes that exist, which are the ones that kill us and have we mitigated those well enough? And we built probably, um, like for the Movi, for example, probably 40 prototypes before we went into production. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, where do you see your business is going? Like, wow, this dream kind of pinnacle stuff. And then as your businesses have grown, like how is that, you know, vision and maybe like dreamscape change? Um, yeah, like pinnacles and then, you know, once you get there, like looking up. We, we want to replace everyone's second car to begin with, and then we want to replace everyone's first car. So that's, <laughs> that's the goal. But yeah, so we, we just want to create, a, I mean, there's a transportation revolution occurring. The, the, the ultimate form of uh, single occupancy vehicles and electric bike, whether it's got a cover on or, or you're out in the elements with a rain jacket on when it's raining out. Um, so now it's just about getting one in everyone's hands. So it's about getting people to test ride electric bikes because most people have no idea what they're even like. As soon as you get on it, you get the EV grin and then you just basically have to buy one. <laughs> in 20 years, we're gonna be selling you the Star Trek replicator and today you can go to glowforge.com and get as close as possible to right now. <laughs> Same since we started. Um, this may be not applicable to that at all, but uh, I feel like one of the things that people worry about when they start pursuing turning their passion into a career is that they'll become disenchanted with it. Maybe it's completely that smart. Uh, I'm curious, like, if you all have ever gotten close to that point, do you have what you've done with that? I can definitely. Um, empathize with that because I think at least with my specific personality where I'm most engaged and most fun is finding new spaces and so there comes a time in a business where you have found the space you found the product market fit you're ramping up um, but that really takes somebody who's more of like an algorithmic uh, business doer at that point that wants to optimize and refine the system rather than find new spaces so I think it's really important to figure out what kind of person you are and where you're best 
because um, I'm definitely be not best like extracting an additional 5% margin out of the product line. I'm much better at finding the next thing that we're going to do. And if you try and, you know, just a, just a, if you try and fit me into that box, it's going to be bad for everybody. <laughs> Any more? I have one last question. So if people want to find out more about you, um, your company, or um, maybe have some follow-up questions when they leave, how can they get in touch with you? Well, we have a tasting room in Ballard. <laughs> <laughs> so you can come there and taste our product and hang out in our large beer garden, which is awesome in the summertime. Um, or you can buy our product in stores, or you can email Peddler. Um, I am the one who checks the emails, so I will get your email and can respond to you. Yeah, my, my email is mike at radpowerbikes.com with an S at the end, not bike. <laughs> right more. Um, and then uh, hashtag ride rad on social media. Uh, I'm Dan Shapiro on Twitter, and that's usually the best way to get my attention. Uh, and if you want to learn more about Glowforge, if you've got a phone, type this in, glowforge.com slash F-O-D. That's my friend of Dan discount. So you oh, can get nice. up to $500 off a of pro delivered in about a week. <laughs> so my email is Dave at FreeFly Systems, oh, yeah. and uh, you can follow everything that you can follow everything that FreeFly is doing mostly on Instagram. Uh, it's where we're most active. Instagram we do a lot of live events and fun stuff on there. Or you can contact Cindy. Cindy loves it. She's all Cindy's about contacting. <laughs> she is. Yes, I am. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing so much of what you have done and, and where you want to go. We really appreciate it. Um, I know that everyone wants to kind of meet you personally and, and mingle, so I think we'll probably wrap it, right? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Dexter uh, was happy enough to let one of you guys be a lucky winner to for the extra wallet. Uh, Sean, our general manager, walked around handing out these tickets. And now we're doing the drawing, so we'll be the We're handing it down to the bottom. All right, so ticket number 2174. Winner. 2174. I never win. Like <laughs> Which is this thing for people who don't this know. Thing, right? oh, oh, wait. This one. Yeah. They're stuck together. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so lucky winner, two, one, seven, three, one. Oh, come on, let's try it together. Two, one, seven, three. I think that's me. Holy shit, dude. Damn. Damn.